Well, uh, Al, thank you so much for helping my project. Could you say a little bit about yourself? All righty. Uh, I also am a Toastmaster uh, in uh, the Austin, Texas area. I am um, 60, or will be 62 in August. Uh, I work for the state, uh, state of Texas as a environmental permit um, processor. I've uh, been doing that for about 20, 25, 26 years, something like that. I was born in the Midwest, born in the St. Louis area. Um, and I grew up around McDonald Douglas. My dad worked for McDonald Douglas when I was young. Um, and uh, as evidenced by my picture, other picture there the, on the desktop there was uh, in the Navy for a while uh, after college. Um, and I got out, I started working, got out. I ended up moving here to Austin, Texas and I've been here ever since. And I'm married with a child. Um, married, uh, married. Oh gosh, twenty, um, twenty years. Gosh, how many, how many years I've been married? Um, more than twenty-five. Well, uh, how old was your anyway, child? Twenty some odd years. He's fifteen. Fifteen. <laughs> so okay. Between that, more than fifteen. <laughs> So uh, maybe a, a sophomore in, in high school then. That's right. Mm -hmm. and I, I'm sorry, actually 16. He just turned 16. And they grow up so quick. Yeah. They do. Yeah. I, so That's I, probably good. You, you mentioned you were born in 1959, so uh, 10 years before uh, Neil and Buzz landed on the moon. Mm hmm. Yes. And what was yeah. that like seeing that? That was very exciting. I remember they had te televisions on in school during that time. And so we all got to watch it at school, watch them walk around and stuff like that. Um, it was very exciting. I was very impressed. Uh, I, that, that just gave me hope that we would uh, be there in full force one day. Um, I used to think I would hope that I would be part of that force, <laughs> but uh, that, that was not to be. But um, yeah, it was very exciting. I, do you have some thoughts on uh, why people um, thought that space exploration and, and travel uh, would be what would come about? Um, at that time, I mean, uh, did, did people really think that everybody would be traveling to the moon and into space, or was that just a few people that thought that? Hmm, that's a good question. You know, I don't know how prevalent that idea was. Uh, you know, it was a dream for many folks. Um, you know, all the science fiction shows and movies that even came along before and after um, mostly before the moon landing, I'd say, and even some somewhat after. Uh, I think that just put an idea in people's minds that this could happen, and it could happen anytime. Things seem to move so quickly. It seems like back in the 70s and 80s, it seems like we were just progressing, you know, boom, boom, boom. And I thought, I think people in general thought it could happen. I'm not sure they really expected it as a foregone conclusion in their lifetimes, but <clears throat> relatively soon in the, in the grand scheme of man, I think they thought it was gonna happen sooner than later, so. I guess many of them saw uh, commercial airline travel uh, kind of went from a, something non-existing to, um, you know, actually something that people, albeit a little bit uh, limited number of people, could actually participate in. Mm -hmm. And so natural regression, I would think, they probably say, hey, well, space is available. We'll be able to do that in space as well. But uh, 
Nowadays, I think uh, the pace has slowed down. I think uh, <laughs> when I was a young person, I never thought about you know the costs of actually <laughs> accomplishing these feats. And I think uh, the further along we go, it seems like that's a, a bigger consideration, uh, at least in the mind of Americans. Um, and I'm sure some of the other countries as well. Um, and that the price tag looms and nowadays we wonder how, how can we pay for all this? So I know I'm wondering about that. And I, I now know that, yes, those costs were probably pushed out to further generations basically. <laughs> For the later generations are paying the cost, and then uh, now it's on how much can we burden them with in the future, you know? <clears throat> well, and also, it's very different airline travel and I rocket have travel. A um, you know, with the airline, uh, you just fuel it up and you get to go again. No part of the plane has to be replaced, uh, but with the, the rocket, you know, you've been a f you you spend a few years building it only to use it for a few minutes and then throw it away. Right. Yes. Um, you know, that's so. I guess that's part of the engineering of it all. Is how to not do that so much and make it more like an airliner. Yeah, it seems like in, until you do that, the cost will always be too high. Yeah. yeah. Are, are you getting a bit of a lag in the conversation? Yeah. A little bit, yeah. It, it kind of freezes uh, from time to time. Um, but, yeah. you know, it's uh, I it's still acceptable, I, I, I suppose. I mean, yeah, I can still understand what you're saying. <laughs> okay. Here. Uh, do you remember the last time we went to the moon? Oh, uh, actually, no. I couldn't even put a date on it. Let's see. Um, Could you put a decade maybe? on it? Do you think it was? I don't even remember. I don't do you think remember. it was the 60s, 70s, or 80s? Well, we landed in 16, so early 70s. Uh, I think we were done by the time. I think we were done by the time I graduated high school, which was 77. So I'm gonna say early 70s, but I forgot exactly which. Uh, yeah, you'd be right. Uh, 1972 is the last time. In fact, I think the number of people uh, alive today um, who were born after that time is uh, much higher than the, the people who were born, uh, who were alive during that time. Mm. All right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I can see that. Uh, let's see. You also uh, wrote uh, that uh, you were a big fan of a, mo of a movie or TV series called Space 1999 was yes i've never heard of it can you tell me about it oh boy let's see uh i know um uh, martin landau and i think barbara mcnane the head blind star i think it was produced in england uh but it was uh it was about moon base alpha and just kind of like a some of the things about the the TV show that 
really drew you to it that you liked? Uh, I guess just the fact that, uh, you know, there was a presence, man, man had a presence on the moon and uh, they were able to just, uh, they, they flew these shovels around. Um, I think it was the special space like um, there were uh, guy you know, ships on guy what kind of things. But uh, God, what else did they, what did they do? I don't really call like many of the adventures. Uh, there may have been like um, they were just solving the problems of living on the moon. Uh, there was a nuclear accident they had to kind of protect themselves from at one point and just getting around all that. Uh, I don't know if it was a lot of geopolitical kind of stuff. Um, but just the whole idea of, uh, they were just, you know, they had, a, I guess it was a base of like a couple of hundred, maybe a couple hundred people, I think. And they had their little satellites around there and they, they, and they, just, they traveled with ease on the moon. Um, uh, and I think that I think this where the station was designed it, it had a, like a central hub with lots of little uh, connected by uh, other connected to other little hubs around it or uh, other little um, substations or some sub modules or whatever. Uh, but just that idea of being out there and experiencing that and that was the the launching pad for you know further exploration uh, I, don't, I don't know they may have uh, had other missions to other planets as well haven't seen it haven't seen much haven't seen it so long I don't remember a lot about it I kind of want to research it now I'm like, I, should, I should, have done, should have done that before we got on the call so I can remember that but Anyway. Uh, does that still excite you about the possibility of having a moon base with people living on it? Uh, hmm. uh, so I guess so. It does. I'm more animated about it now. Uh, back, I, I was a bit of a, had a little bit of an explorer bent in me. And uh, so that was, I guess I was, uh, you know, just being, uh, and so it was more exciting. And uh, now I, I see myself as premier bound. I don't think I'm going to. <laughs> uh, you can tell me now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that kind of idea is exciting for for mankind, I think, for me, hopefully it can be done. We can actually, it'd be a great achievement to, technological achievement to do that. And hopefully it will be done. Uh, yeah, we might get started here, like I said, like you mentioned in 2024, we're trying to come back, go back. And I'm still running. <laughs> but, uh, Probably won't be here too much longer into the next century. Um, I'm hoping that we'll progress and keep going um, and expand our reach. So that's what I'm going to remain on. So. I, do you think uh, it's fairly inevitable that that would happen? Or do you think it's. Um unlikely or uh, what's your feeling on sort of, uh, will we ever actually have people live on the, the moon? I think it's very likely. I think the fact that we have been there and back, and we can do that and we're thinking about going back. I think it's fairly likely that we will um, we, mankind will make it back and, and, and establish a presence. Uh, this, the, the speed of it, I don't know. That's the thing. Uh, I, 
I definitely see it in the next 100 years. Uh, I don't know how it will be. It has to be an uh, international kind of effort, I think, for it to work. Um, but I, yeah, I think it'll take you know, global resources and global commitment. But I think, uh, I think one day we'll do it. One day. I, and let's see, regarding us going back to the moon in 2024, is that something you had heard before uh, You know, we had arranged this interview? Uh, yes, actually. Um, it was about two years ago that so my, my son's in, in Scouts and uh, they had a trip. We took a trip to uh, NASA Houston. Uh, they had the scouts come in and stay on base on the on the uh, the center. Gave us tours of the area. So in during the tour, that was discussed. We got a chance to see the uh, mission control of um, of old, and also I think they were also doing some rehearsals for the, the dragon mission that was coming up later. So. I, I, we had to be quiet so as not to disturb them over the other control room. But yeah, so they talked a lot about that. Um, forgot the code names. Um, uh, but yes, it, it was talked about. Um, most of the non-space people I've interviewed, I would say as many as 80% of them, I had not heard we were planning to go back to the moon. In fact, uh, some of them thought that uh, NASA had shut down. Others thought that, you know, the moon is where all the astronauts went all the time and that we never stopped going. Um, mm. what, what do you think NASA should do differently in order to let more people know about it? Well, I don't know. Uh, of course, that's a little PR effort. Uh, they're probably saying, well, why, why are we investing? They, they already invest some money into their PR. They've, they've got their website. Um, I guess they could reach out and make um, like a public, um, public announcements or something like that every once in a while, maybe a monthly uh, press release, uh, something like that. Um, it's up to the, basically the media the mainstream media to take it up and cover because it's not it's not it's not mainstream media people don't know it. it's like uh, like uh shouting in the forest i guess you know a tree falls in the woods you know <laughs> so if they're not if there's not a, a bullhorn to reach people uh most people are not going to know and then probably a lot are just not even excited about it like, oh moon yeah been there done that <laughs> so it's like, well, not lately. <laughs> so, and, uh, and then, and then yeah, the other thing is, you know, what's in it for me? People want to know, well, what's in it for me? The average Joe, Jane, you know, and they got to understand that. So I guess NASA could do that. Uh, I tell you, well, this is in it for us later down the road. If we, if we do things right. <clears throat> Uh, what do you see as in it for you uh, regarding our return to the moon in 2024? I mean, um, well, are you? I presume you're supportive of that. And if you are, what do you hope to get out of it? Um, I do hope that we will uh, learn to conquer even more some of the challenges that we faced of uh, just being out in outer space. Um, I guess a better shielding. Uh, I guess I learned how to uh, uh, produce materials uh, for use back on Earth. Uh, and there's a pharmaceutical area there, uh, low gravity uh, manufacturing. Um, 
oxygen production, uh, and then just uh, creation of creation of a, a staging area, you know, the, or further. I, I, and I guess I don't know if that me specifically, but I mean, it's, it's not actually for me, but <sighs> I guess there's a host of benefits. I, I couldn't even imagine the benefits that would occur. Um, some probably things that I could never think of, but in general, uh, I guess we can think back on the, the things that we uh, have been brought about by the prior advancement. Uh, you think about, um, I think about uh, the long came aviation, um, the airplane, and then I just read about uh, a gentleman that helped foster the, one of the first um, um, navigational aids um, for radio navigation and things like that, uh, autopilots, and I think that are now in most airplanes that we fly now commonplace. The materials, uh, materials that were used in the shuttle for uh, reentry, and that was a that was mind blowing to see that you could hold a, a little piece of the insulation there in your hand and be twenty seven hundred degrees, and it's uh, it's just some things you never think about hardly, um, and what can be done. You never know the use of that, can, so. Uh, just, and just expanding our, our reach, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have to start from the moon, I think, in order to reach out further. To really, um, I always thought about mining the asteroids. That was a big thing I thought of, you know, if I could, yeah, mine the asteroids, gold, whatever is out there. <laughs> but um, so <clears throat> I guess that's what's in it for me, just uh, just this um, better, Hopefully a better economy, I guess, world economy in general. <clears throat> now, if you consider at the time between uh, Christopher Columbus leaving Europe and coming uh, to North America uh, till now, that's about 500 years. And if we were to kind of imagine what might happen in the next 500 years, do you see humanity mainly on the Earth making little trips to places like the moon and space? Or do you see us fundamentally expanding uh, the domain of humanity uh, to include uh, space, the moon, Mars, the asteroids, uh, you know, the moons of Jupiter, the moons of Saturn? Like, what would be your expectation if you were to come back 500 years? What, what would, would make you think, uh, you, you know, Yes, that that that's how far we should have gotten. Well, I would hope uh, five hundred years from now, I would hope that we would basically dominate the solar system, um, be able to, if not even establish uh, human presence on these other planets, at least. At least uh, be able to reach them with ease, and uh, maybe extract or explore some of these, uh, either the inner and the outer planets, uh, a little better. Maybe uh, obtain some resources from them. I know there's um, uh, there's the Compressed gases, uh, there are Jupiter and Neptune and so forth uh, for use. I'm not sure. And maybe we'll, I don't know, uh, and maybe at least establish some presence around them. Uh, maybe uh, establish some, I think, in what the Lagrange points, I guess, that exist in the, around the solar system, I guess, be able to establish some, some solar or interplanetary bases, you know, that is like Deep Space Nine, except, <laughs> except here in the solar system, but uh, <clears throat> just have some places to, you know, nose to travel around. I, I would think that could be done in 500 years. Um, probably 
more toward the latter that I'm not sure in the next how far we're going the next hundred but hopefully after one or two hundred now we'll make some better strides and maybe uh, it seems like technology seems like it uh, expands exponentially so the further we go it seems like things things will increase quickly more quickly so that's what I'm thinking of course um sometimes technology gets developed and the people that inherit that technology don't um, understand it and they're unable to really build on it or repair it. Yes, that can happen. Yes, it could happen. And um, that would be unfortunate. <laughs> I tell you, I think uh, um, people a hundred years ago knew a lot more about taking care of horses than we do today. Yeah, that's very true. A hundred uh, years from now, people will be wondering. Uh, people will be wondering why we were changing spark plugs and uh, having to do oil changes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, when you mentioned the horses, uh, but I, uh, my boss has a daughter that um, rides horses, uh, and she's into that. So I guess there'll probably always be some of us, some of them around. Um, maybe not so many, but uh, that's a good point. Uh, hmm. I don't know. Yeah, a hundred years from now, people will be like, "You've had to put liquid in your car to make it go. Why would you do that? Why would you do that, <laughs> would you do that when we could just..." I don't know, what would you do? <laughs> when you have this little thing, it just, I don't know. And at some point, uh, really? we'll, we'll have some type of coding that will actually um, allow for you to generate electricity from from the sun. And so you just ah, go park yeah. your, you just go park your car out in the sunny place and wait until it gets charged and then you're ready to go. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe we'll be back to some kind of, Mass transit, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if we're going to go, go which way we go on that. I guess it depends on uh, what the population looks like. We're going to have overcrowding or, or not. Yeah. And now, you know, I mean, with uh, telecommunications and people able to work uh, largely remotely, you know, why commute anywhere? Yeah. Why commute? That's it. We might go in that direction. Yeah, we don't know. We or maybe no back to horses. Who knows? <laughs> back to horses. <laughs> maybe we'll go back. Maybe that's right. Maybe we'll say, hey, this is a better life. You know, the agrarian life is the way to go. Uh, um, if it was safe and affordable, uh, would you take a trip to space? Well, <laughs> I did a speech about that. <laughs> Postmasters Club a while back. Um, I guess it talked about, uh, I think it was the title of my, uh, the first kid on the moon was the title of the speech. My mom said that I was, I was a kid and I think I had done something. I'd done something wrong. She was mad at me. She said, boy, I'm going to send you to the moon. And I said, get my coat, get my coat. I was ready to go. So I guess maybe I'm still that kid. So if it were possible, affordable, I said, yeah, get my coat. I think I'd go. And I think uh, you and I um, met through Patrice uh, from the Toastmasters Club and they're in uh, Austin. Is that correct? That's I, right. Yes. She used to. She met me. She used to be here in Houston, and she and I was in the HP Toastmasters Club together. Oh, oh, okay. Well, nice, very nice. And I know in Toastmasters, uh, feedback is a very critical part of the process. Mm -hmm. I, I was wondering if you might have some feedback for me, uh, something that I'm doing right in terms of these interviews I should keep doing, and something that I could improve on. 
Well, things are done well, very punctual. Thank you. Uh, have a very nice present. Uh, uh, going, uh, easy to listen to. Uh, the pace of the questions is very good. It, it accounts for the, I guess, in the glitchiness of our system a little. So not speaking too fast really, really helps that. Uh, good smile. <laughs> And uh, I don't know negative. Uh, I don't know if there's any negatives. Uh, things doing better. I don't know that you were prepared. You have you have my my setup there, and, and you asked me things about myself. I didn't ask you about yourself, which I should have. But <laughs> uh, yes, you're um, a very good interviewer. I think. Don't know what else could be done better. Are, well, you, are you a DTM? I um, I think I was at one point. I mean, no, no, I, I just oh. I'm not a DTM, uh, but I did finish the uh, ten speeches. Uh, what are you after you finish the ten okay. speeches? I did a CTM. CTM. I'm a, C I'm a CTM then. Yeah, me too. That's that's as far as I. I'm still in Toastmasters. I, I never progressed beyond into the, the other ranges. And now they're employees and, uh, and they, don't have the, those, they don't have the CTM, ATM things anymore. So, so I'm still TM. I uh, have a North Houston Space Society chapter that I've helped put together. And last year, I started a program based upon my experience with Toastmasters called the Space Communicator uh, Program. And the idea is that uh, instead of having people come to our uh, monthly meetings and just sitting there uh, watching a presentation to try to get them in front of the audience, sharing some things about them. So I had it uh, simplified with just three types of speeches. Uh, one's called the personal space speech. So it's supposed to be like a five to 10 minute uh, speech about what is space to me. Maybe it's some personal event you had or some dream you have or what got you into it. Uh, one's the, the technical space speech where you're supposed to go over like a, a science or engineering concept and try to explain it so a general audience could understand it. And a third speech called the community space speech, which is supposed to be like the we of space, which is very uh, broad. It could be about uh, history or government or you know, business or, or something like that. And uh, I thought it was, we only had really three participants and two people continue complete all, all um, three speeches. Uh, one of them uh, was a, a, a a 10 year old that wants to become an astronaut. So that's kind of neat to uh, get her in front of an audience uh, sharing her enthusiasm and knowledge. That is nice. Very cool. Uh, I, I, it seems like there's been more participation there in the Houston area of that. Gosh, you would think that'd have been like 100 people, we'd think at least. <laughs> Maybe it just needs more promotion and also another thing, um, stopping the in-person meetings in April and switching to Zoom really limited sort of um, the ability to bring new people into the, mm. the society in, in the ways okay. that we were doing, uh, you know, through right. advertisements at the library and, and right. uh, uh, that type of thing. But, but I, I thought it was, I thought it was, uh, I really like Toastmasters. I like how they have like, uh, you know, kind of like, a path, you know, there, you, you don't have to, um, I, I mean, they have a good uh, kind of framework and setup for continuous improvement and advancement. Mm -hmm. Yes, I like that too. And I like the camaraderie, uh, like uh, Patrice is a member of our club um, and she's been in our club about, uh, four or five years, 
in that range. I've been in the club about 20 years. <laughs> so, uh, and the, the club is actually is about 30 years old. I think it started in, oh God, what was that club? Mm. I don't recall now, I should know that. Approximately 30 years old, maybe 31, 32. But uh, in that time, you know, well, I know the people and that just built that camaraderie, uh, kind of like, especially some of the longtime members, one of the co-founders is still, a couple of them are still in the club. And just having that relationship, we can we had it while we were in person, and we continue it in Zoom, and so that's been nice. I mean, I may not have continued to progress and achieve those other levels, but I've, I've always enjoyed just being being around those folks, you know, w on a weekly basis. So that, that's helped me. And you know, Toastmasters, uh, our group here, we had a, a district and area and state contest um, each year. Have you all been able to continue with that virtually uh, with the COVID or was that put on hold because of not able to have in-person meetings? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Toastmasters in general has basically moved to the, uh, the Zoom method of meeting. Yeah. Um, so the contests and everything have just moved to uh, the virtual mode. Uh, and even as far as the, I believe the international speech, worldwide, the worldwide contest uh, went internationally. And uh, of course, I don't know if you heard, but we had a guy from Austin win the international last year. Wow, congratulations, that's be, awesome. Yes, uh, he, uh, I guess it was initially supposed to be held in France. Uh, and so I'm not sure how exactly, but I didn't attend. I should have attended, at least I log in at some point. But yeah, basically people come associated from home. I'm not sure how they did all the breakout sessions, other meetings, but basically just, Toastmasters just pivoted and just said, hey, we're gonna do it like this now. Uh, and question for me is, I wonder how much of it we're going to, once the COVID phase is over, how much we'll, we'll go back to the old way or we'll be at a, one of my, I have another club, we'll do a hybrid meeting or have had hybrid <laughs> where uh, somebody opened their home, uh, they had a, a ranch place and people were meeting there uh, in person and they broadcast from there and all the rest of us would be from our homes. And so I'm wondering if on the other side, we'll have more like hybrid type meetings from now on where you have your, your in-person meeting and then people that tune in from the outside uh, and just make that available. So I don't know. Our North Houston Space Society uh, chapter before COVID was all in-person. And then of course, since April, we've been doing it online. And uh, we're thinking about if we ever meet back in person again, which I feel hopeful won't be too many months away of continuing as a hybrid format. One challenge I've had with hybrid formats though, in the meetings that I've participated in, it always seems like that one of the two groups of people get shortchanged. Either you're too busy like fiddling uh, with the telecommunications equipment, uh, you know, and, and the meeting in person is sort of on hold or uh, maybe the, the virtual uh, participants get more attention. And then sometimes, which is probably more likely, the people that are attending virtually are just uh, kind of out of mind, out of sight. And uh, they're like, I, I am over here. <laughs> What's mm -hmm. been your experience with the hybrid setup? Well, uh, uh, I have not, attended the in-person, but uh, during the hybrid, uh, we have had technological problems, especially from the, for those at the, uh, at the uh, location, the in-person location. And by the way, uh, that in-person location is now folded. I guess the, the people there, I think they, they noticed that 
there's there was a dwindling presence. Uh, there only had a handful of people coming in at all in the first place, and at the last meeting, there's maybe maybe one guy and one or two other people that came had come in from you know, the outside, and so they decided they would just end it. Uh, so now we're back to 100% Zoom. But yeah, but we noticed that people there that it was sometimes they'd be speaking like that, speaking to the audience, and <laughs> and the people when they're not facing the camera, they could it was just all different. There was and sometimes the the feed got very glitchy. You couldn't hear, couldn't see. Sometimes and sometimes last time actually the last meeting was really good. Uh, I'm so sorry that uh, they decided to end it because it was they had a nice setup. It was the feed was great, uh, and then also about the hybrid. Yes, depending on the, I guess the person's uh, personal home setup, sometimes the audio was horrible. I remember, <laughs> I remember our president's uh, audio was very horrible for a long time, and. Uh, Anyway, so yeah, we have there were problems, uh, but on the whole, I think on the whole, people are still enjoying and come and they come, they come back, uh, and we may even have a new member uh, who was at that, who was a virtual guy for the last meeting, and he inquired about joining. So I think we're still getting some people even during COVID and willing to participate in the in the. Uh, virtual manner. Uh, so we'll see. I'm so looking forward to seeing people in person again. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate your time, Al. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to? I really didn't have a lot of expectations. I just. I just heard you were doing this and I just uh, wanted to be a part of it uh, and uh, I'm just glad we got a chance to talk and uh, I hope this project works out well for you and and the best of luck. Uh, it's exciting and I'm actually I'm really excited to see how it kind of all turns out now. <laughs> Indeed and you know I have um, over 1400 more days to go to the end of 2024. So if you know of any other uh, volunteers uh, that might be willing to participate, uh, please send them my direction. Oh, okay, all righty. I'll, I'll do what I can. I'll, I don't know any other space geeks like myself, but uh, I'm sure they're out there. But, um... Well, actually, I was kind of hoping to interview uh, the general population. Uh, you, my original goal was to go up to people at Starbucks and to interview <clears throat> them. With uh, COVID nineteen, going up to random people at Starbucks is uh, feels like it'd be ill advised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's not a good thing. But um, so I guess the way that uh, Pepe was really great. He just mentioned it, and so. It was just in an email, and so just uh, that's what I can do. I guess I can email just the people that I know in, uh, in my network and see who uh, who, who takes it up. Actually, my, my son is selling um, peppermint bark as a fundraiser for his Eagle Project, and I put a post on on my Facebook page, and so that drew some people in. So that that might be something I could do, you know. I could mention that you're doing this, put it on my Facebook page that I actually can, that I participated in this interview, and um, and see if people reach out. That would be fantastic. I'd appreciate that. I was also thinking, you know, for Toastmasters who are looking at trying to improve their verbal communication. This is a uh, kind of another format uh, to sort of practice those skills in. I think so. Yeah, being in, in a conversation, in an interview, and there there are some. At least there were uh, some uh, 
Toastmasters uh, modules like that, I believe. Uh, speaking on television or, or just uh, in the in-person interview or something like that, where the part of the, you play the interviewer and then and you, there's someone you interview. So that was part, that was a project, I remember. I, I don't think I ever did it, but I saw it done. I think one of our Toastmasters in the clubs had done it. <clears throat> Patrice did it at one point, but um, yeah. That's a, a good point I should research is, is there a, a Toastmaster project that either this project uh, would fit right into or was like slight alterations we can make it fit into. And then I could kind of uh, mention that as, as being uh, a possibility. I'm, I'm sure there is. <laughs> I'm sure there is. I'm not sure exactly which one, but yeah, you'll find it. I know you'd find it if you research it. Well, uh, thank you so much, Al. I hope you have a good rest of your yes. day and it was such a pleasure to get to meet you. Yes, thank you, Nathan. Same here. And best of luck with your project. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. <laughs>